Northern Golf is bringing you some of Australia's most interesting minds right to your kitchen table with our Croker Conversation series. Hello and welcome to another edition of Croker Conversations. My name's Sally Fields, I'm the Intensive Agricultural Officer and today we are interviewing Brian Welberg from New South Wales. Hi Brian, how are you doing today? Very well, thanks Sally. Uh, hard not to be uh, feeling well in uh, a place like this. Yeah, it looks really beautiful down there. Where exactly are you today? Uh, so we have a, a small property just inland from Port Macquarie on the mid-north coast. Um, so it's still fairly coastal, but we're starting to get up, up the mountains a fair bit. So as you can see, the topography in the backgrounds, uh, I call it beautiful, um, <laughs> but high rainfall. So we normally average about 1.2 meters a year um, and sort of pretty much guaranteed an inch a, an inch a month. So um, yeah, things tend to happen here fairly quickly. Um, had some big fires this last year. So all that forest of country on the, on the far slope there was all burnt last year. Um, but it's, it's come back fairly, fairly positively and fairly well. So yeah, no, it's, it's looking beautiful again. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, we've had good rain here, good autumn rain this last week and, and things are still really green for us uh, in, um, well, I, I'm quite coastal, but at elevation at Koa is where I am today. One of the things that I often come across, you know, when, when talking to farmers around the country is how things are changing. And again, so one of the, the big secrets to success is that flexibility and the be, be in the mindset that, you know, we need to accept change. Change is the norm. Yes. The minute we get ourselves set in any particular uh, rut or process, uh, you're more or less setting yourself up to failure somewhere down the track. Yes. So just being aware of the seasons and, you know, the rainfall and everything else uh, and, and managing accordingly um i think is a huge part of of creating success for for landholders yes i would agree with you there it seems like the only constant is change and i'm, I'm not sure whose quote it is you'd probably be able to tell me but it's it's just such a gem it's that that one where the pain when the pain of cha when the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change then you will then you'll change it doesn't i think it's a bit different than that but it's such a gem there's two ways to look at that um we know crisis and fear which is basically what you're talking about uh does create change but it often doesn't create sustained change mm. um you know it often creates short-term adjustment like when the fires were on uh socially this community this little valley here uh, we're really connected. We were talking to each other. We were sharing you know, uh, teas and biscuits and what have you, and smoke breaks and what have you. But as soon as that that threat dissipated, um, most people just went back to to the way they were before. Mm. And I think we're we're the same with most things. Um, you know, the current crisis uh, around the climate and what have you drives short-term adjustment. But if we're going to get on top of the problems, we really need sustained change. And for me, the, the only real way of creating sustained change is, is through, through a carrot, a positive uh, enforcement um, for everything you do. Today, we're talking about holistic land management. Um, what was your driver to get involved with holistic management and what, what inspired you to take that path, Brian? I was uh, born and bred uh, third generation Zimbabwean. And... Uh, so I was fortunate to be born, um, you know, with close contact with a lot of sort of wildlife uh, on the farm, and so that developed a deep, uh, I suppose, a deep passion for me. And so when I started farming myself, one of the things that really drove me was um, was my interest in wildlife, which led me to develop, um, you know, a, a wildlife enterprise on the farm um, through tourism and and a bit of hunting, and. Um, yeah, just, just that wanting to make, make the wildlife blossom. Um, you know, if you have a good season, especially back then, uh, if you had a good season, you couldn't just pop along to the auctions and buy more animals. Um, you, had to, you had to create the resilience in the landscape. So, you know, with the change we were talking about, with we have good seasons and bad seasons and droughts and floods, your land could maintain healthy populations of, of wildlife. Um, and so, yeah, you know, it was, I suppose, the passion behind the wildlife that really drove me to, to start looking for some answers. And I was really fortunate in the piece, um, because when we started, you know, the, the government agencies were, 
we're really pushing this idea of burning every four years because it was natural. And uh, so we started small burning patches all over the place and we got this huge uh, in invasion of thorn scrub. And uh, I was really lucky around that time, someone said to me, well, why don't we go and listen to this fellow, Alan Savory? He was talking at a, at a similar uh, private wildlife sanctuary to the one I was running and developing. Um, and so we spent some time with Alan in the bush listening to what he had to say. And I suppose that triggered change in, with me. Um, it really just made sense at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Uh, holistic management is, is very, very simple. But because it's different, um, it's quite hard for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it's that, that connection with wildlife and I suppose in a way connection to nature that, that you know, pushed me along this route to, to find some different answers. Mm, but I find if, as the landscape gets healthier, you do see the native wildlife moving in and that's always such a joy for me when, when I'm, um, when I'm implementing land practices, if I leave some, like I guess like some nature strips or I notice that there's some finches nesting somewhere, I'll, um, I'll make a, I'll make the fence go around that so they can still have their area and then I can still uh, use the cattle as a tool to improve the land. But in, um, I guess, trying to work in with, with uh, the little creatures that are already living here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, again, what holistic management is really about is accepting as, as a human, you are, you are nature. Um, you are part of nature. Everything about us is, is, is uh, intricately involved with nature. So if you damage your environment, ultimately you damage yourself. Mm. And, uh, you know, I always laugh because especially after the drought and then after the fires, as soon as that, uh, that uh, little bit of green came through the paddock, everything somehow uh, became better. You know, people in towns were smiling at each other. People stopped and had a chat and cracked a joke. And really, it was just about the environment waking up and, and becoming alive and helpful again. Mm -hmm. And that impacted on people's mental mental um, state and how they interacted with each other. It was yeah, it was just so so dramatic after this last year with the fires and the droughts combined, mm -hmm. and how that had impacted on people's behaviour. But as soon as yeah, the drought broke and the grass became green again and life started coming back into those environments. People's whole mindset changed. Um, you know, we, we are totally connected to our environment. Yeah, you could nearly say there's a direct correlation between happiness and the health of environment, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. I, you know, I think anybody who thinks five minutes about it will acknowledge that. You know, you, you, you get, you get great feelings from your environment, you get inspired by your environment. We are so connected to our environment. And I think, I think it goes back to the days of Aristotle somewhere along the line that um, you know, somehow we got the idea that we controlled our environment. And if we could just find the right switches and flick them in the right order, we'd fix all the problems. But in fact, you know, we are our environment. You know, if you put a moisturizer on your skin, where does it go? You know, it goes, goes through your skin. We think the skin is some kind of barrier. It's not. It's it's really porous. Mm -hmm. So you know, just one of the key components of holistic management is just acknowledging, you know, you are your environment at the end of the day. So you've had your business inside outside management for some years now. Could you tell our golf viewers uh, what what services do you actually provide um, within that business model? Yeah. So uh, shortly after coming immigrating to Australia, we ended up in Central Queensland uh, managing with some uh, some large cattle properties out there and uh, very soon I started up the uh, with a fellow holistic management educator Helen Lewis who's still teaching from Warwick in Queensland we started a little company called Inside Outside Management at that time you could still get the farm business subsidies so being a company was an advantage for that and um, we started delivering holistic management training as both of us had been trained by Alan Savory uh, to become educators to teach his materials um, and so we developed the company and started training and we ran the training company well the company still runs today i run the company helen's now doing uh, pretty much her own thing um, and we offer training all around australia uh, we've done a bit of training in new zealand 
and I've still got some consulting work that we do in, in places in Africa. Um, and then about seven years ago, we got involved with uh, TAFE in New South Wales, and we developed a, a holistic management diploma in TAFE, uh, which again was fantastic, and it was a great pathway through to a lot of your uh, rural degrees, so rural business or, or agricultural degrees, you could use the holistic management diploma as a pathway through to that. So that's again a first for the world, and uh, it gave us a great, great um, window in, in Australia to get more holistic management thinking out there in the in the communities. Yeah, that's when I first met you. I, that must have been in that time. I think it was 2014 that I did that eight day. Um, eight-day course with you out of Clunes in northern New South Wales. Yep. Uh, yeah, that was one of the first. I think we've run we've run seven courses out of there now and seven at Mawulumba, which is only, what, an hour away. Mm. Um, so, you know, the, there's just this big push on, and thank God for that, because, I mean, we certainly need to change the way we're managing uh, our environment through agriculture when you look at the damage we're doing uh, and the loss of species, et cetera. Um, so currently, I, I'm really excited about that that groundswell of change that's happening. You can't pick up a, a newspaper or a magazine or listen to the news without there being something about regenerative agriculture or alternative ways of, of managing land and producing food. And I think, you know, that's, that's just a wonderful thing. Um, and I often look at farmers' markets as being a good indicator of that. You know, farmers' markets have blossomed everywhere in Australia and all around the world. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time to be working in agriculture and particularly in the regenerative agriculture space. Um, yep. Yeah, we're going to see, we're just going to see change happening on a greater scale as we move forward is my, is my feeling with it. And just seeing that how much regenerative agriculture articles and podcasts and books are, are, um, are surfacing. You'd, you'd really notice it being, being having worked yeah. in the space now for, over a decade, um, yeah, you'd you'd be you'd be really excited, I'd imagine. Oh yeah, yeah. And again, I think it's a you know it's a great time to to basically lift your game above practice. You know, we've we've we focused a lot of uh, I suppose our production on 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 practice and certifications and stuff like that. And I mean, you know, in Australia, I think we've got. Is it seven different organic certifications? So you're kind of asking yourself, well, what is what is organic if we've got seven different certifications for it? Um, but we need, as as we go through this rapid change, uh, which is needed in agriculture, those processes that people are, have been doing for you know all their generation, possibly their, their parents' generation, they will change. Um, and so all those practices and processes that we're familiar with there will be huge amounts of change there. So again, we need to change the monitoring that we're doing um, because if we're monitoring those processes, like the certifications, if the practice changes, well, the certifications generally become null and void. So again, with holistic management, we're tending to try and push people towards more outcomes. So actual monitoring, you know, is your land getting better? You know, are you putting more clean water in the creeks? Are you getting more biodiversity in your soils? The actual outcomes that we want, because there's, there's so many different ways of achieving that. There's no right answer. Uh, whereas certifications tend to narrow things down and push us along a, a sort of a way of dealing with management. You know, farm chemicals aren't good or bad. It's the way they're used. No, they're just a tool. It's the way we use the tool that's, that's the issue. Um, so again, with holistic management, we acknowledge all tools, um, you know, from, from a chip or a hammer. But one of the big things with holistic management, and in a way it sort of overshadows um, the real thinking behind holistic management is, is bringing livestock in as a, as a positive tool to manage environments. You know, so often we just see livestock as a, as a, as a production method, as, a, as, a, as an enterprise. Um, but if we can utilize the livestock to mimic nature, um, they can have a huge positive impact. We see that every continent in the world now where people have changed the management of livestock um, and become more proactive in their monitoring. Um, huge improvements in, in the environmental health of the land. 
and it comes at very little cost. You know, um, as I think Joel Sullivan always famously says, says, you know, the, the animals are solar powered, they reproduce themselves and they appreciate on your balance sheet. You know, try and do that with a John Deere tractor. Um, so again, there's some huge potential there for producers to continue to increase production, but reduce costs. Because at the end of the day, we get water, we get biology, we get minerals, and we get sunlight all for free. So if we can capitalize on those four processes, it reduces our costs that we have to pay out of pocket. Mm. But the thinking is what drives all of those. So yeah, as you said, it's a really exciting time for for agriculture, and um, you know, it's to me, it's just onwards and upwards from here. Uh, I think we've hit the bottom, and change is everywhere at the moment, mm. which is great. So I want to uh, I want to announce to um, our golf viewers that um, we're actually going to host Brian up here. It's only a month away now, yeah. We've, we're going to have you up here for yep. a two day course in Mariba on the. 25th and 26th of June. Uh, would you be able to tell us, Brian, a little about what you're going to cover in that two-day workshop? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll be covering the basic environmental side of, of holistic management. So just getting people to acknowledge those key drivers of the environment. As I mentioned, the water cycle, the mineral cycle, uh, the biology, the community dynamics of things, and also everything's powered by the sun. So really our job as farmers is to capture sunlight. So how do we maximize that? Um, so we'll be looking at that. And then we'll also look at all the tools that we have at our disposal and how they impact on the environment, but then focus particularly on animals. And um, our livestock can give us a tool in, a positive tool in two ways, either just the grazing part of it and we'll have a quick look at, at uh, things like the grazing chart, which was developed by Savory to, or came from the, the British military from Sandhurst, but was developed to manage the complexity that we have to deal with when, when managing farm animals. So we'll have a, a quick look at that. We won't go into that in much detail. I normally spend you know, just two days uh, doing the, the grazing planning side, but we'll have a look at the grazing charts and uh, have a chat around the grazing planning. And then also the other part of uh, the tool that large grazing animals give us is the tool of impact. So it's the dunging, the urinating, the trampling, and we can utilize that very much so as a positive tool, um, especially when we're looking at things like gully erosion, um, healing landscapes from, from past, and whether it's weed infections, bare ground, gullies, things like that. We can use that tool of animal impact very effectively. So that'll be the focus of, of, of our two days together, looking at the environment, and then looking at the tools and just touching base with the with the grazing planning side of things because I think most producers find that really exciting because it it makes managing the complexity of the farm really easy and it's visual and it's a piece of paper and you can all sit around a table and share ideas. Um, so to me, it's a really powerful tool for farmers to to adapt. I you know, I always say. My, mine lives on my toilet door. It's my first port of call every morning. And it tells everybody where I am, where the animals are, um, and what's happening on the property. So I look forward to sharing ideas around particularly the grazing chart. It's, it's a useful tool for farmers. Um, we've designed the two days. So uh, hopefully if people want to learn more about holistic management, uh, we can then set up further two-day sessions. I normally run a full program as four two-day sessions. And we do the environmental work. We then do uh, the holistic context and the uh, decision-making framework. Because at the end of the day, you know, every piece of land that you see around you is the result of management, of decisions. And I've, I've never met a farmer who wakes up in the morning and says, I'm off to go and destroy a bit of my paddock or my farm. But somehow or other, we all do it. And so we really need to focus on the decision-making because that's at the core of of all the devastation, destruction, loss of habitat, loss of biodiversity that we're seeing ourselves in at the moment, and ultimately, you know, loss of loss of farmers from the land. So it should be a, a really enjoyable, busy, but useful two days that I, uh, we'll be spending next month. Uh, I'm super excited to host you in the north, and and just touching on the land planning side of the course, I particularly 
enjoyed those sessions and being able to do you still use the um, transparent paper so you can rub things out and overlay bits absolutely absolutely I'm afraid um, I just see sadly when people you know computers are, are convenient and handy and you know I, I use one to get through all the legwork and the maths but at the end of the day nothing beats a piece of paper on the on the dining room table that uh, members of your team your family can gather around and have input into it so just um for the link uh, for, for the link for this workshop here you can find it on eventbrite um under holistic land management mariba uh we do have a, a cap on numbers brian likes to work with a group you around that 16 grazies is a good number for you yeah brian yeah um it's just a sweet number where yeah there's enough diversity to make it happen and enough people to to, to create some, some good learning energy um, and and also make it personable, not too many. Hmm. But I'm sure if we've got if we've got big demand, we'll be able to book you down the track for that that first intro again. As uh, Brian, as you said earlier, you've been back to northern New South Wales over a dozen times now, delivering the same course. So we yep. we see that with um, he, he's such an amazing teacher, and the information is so um so life-changing on so many levels that i i'm looking forward to seeing you up in the golf country for many years to come fantastic Sally. i haven't been up for ages uh yeah we ran one course up here in several years ago but i haven't been up for a while so definitely looking forward to the trip up there thank you okay have you got anything else to add well um, we're about to wrap up for this week's croaker conversation hey, no just uh Thank you for, for the work that you're doing. And again, you know, um, let's be the change that we want in the world at the end of the day. Thanks a lot, Brian. Good, Sally. Enjoy.